Good morning, it's Ross War here from Inframanage.com and in this video we're continuing our discussion about infrastructure decision support, the New Zealand IDS project. One of the hidden secrets of New Zealand asset management over the last 20 years. With me is David Fraser and Tens Henning and in this video we're going to be discussing uh, just some recent changes in the industry in the last two years that have been quite exciting for the IDS project and just a p another stage in this adaptation as, as industry needs change. Tens, could you tell us a little bit more about what's happened in the last two years? Ross, I think one of the highlights uh, in the last two years has been a particular council in New Zealand down in the South Island. It's a central Otago district council. In the previous video I spoke about the councils that didn't participate in the project from the beginning and central Otago was one of them. Um, it took them 10 years um, before they saw the need um, to pull in the model. They always thought that perhaps the data wasn't good enough. It's a very small network, a sealed road network of around 350 kilometres and never saw the return that they would get on undertaking the model on their network. Um, at the stage when they start considering it, um, they were looking at making some savings on their network and the council was rightfully uh, concerned about um, reducing the investment on the network and what the possible consequences might be. Um, the DTIMS model was run on their network and um, had a fantastic outcome. It confirmed what the engineers believed to be the appropriate strategy for that network. But I think the greatest value was now having the evidence, scientifically based evidence, in outputs that they could present to their council, who then um, accepted the saving with confidence. One of the things I know also tends about that Central Otago model, it, it's been, or, or the, the design model that you did, it's been so successful that it ended up as a case study in the International Infrastructure Management Manual, um, was they also calibrated the model. They got uh, a very senior contract foreman and their own senior foreman who went out and checked the model production. So you had this, this human and model um, calibration going on and it all lined up and it was uh, their decision, their council, their decision makers uh, took the two together and we're, we're happy to uh, to adjust their, their investment profile. Correct. I have to give credit to the council in terms of their staff, how they adopted the model as part of their process. Um, they decided to do it and then uh, with that committed commitment made a great success of it. I think it's uh, to today uh, one of the big flagships that uh, demonstrate uh, what we are about to achieve in New Zealand. And, and Ross, there's actually another aspect about Central Otago that we haven't picked up on that, and that is, if you looked at the statistics across New Zealand, Central Otago um, would have had one of the lowest costs per kilometre of any of our roading networks. It is based on some very good uh, glacial foundations. Um, the roads are relatively um, cheap in, in terms of some of the other comparative councils to maintain and to run. And, um, and they had very good riding characteristics. So at a snapshot, um, at a high level, you would never have picked Central Otago as one of those people that perhaps you could save lots of money with. And yet the truth is that um, when the model went in, uh, some tremendous savings were generated uh, just with uh, a far more confidence level in how the road was performing in particular. And I think just because I wrote the, the case study up for the International Manual 10, so I know a little bit about this one, um, there was some introduction of some new data collection techniques uh, as part of the development of that model, which is another thing that's happening in the industry over the last couple of years. Correct. The model that we have developed in New Zealand was developed on the basis of we can do a model regardless of the status of the data within a council. Um, however, starting with the model process then gives the, the data so much more purpose and then focus improved data practices, perhaps new data items um, to come in over time and over time the robustness of the outcome then improves with it. Uh, we've seen tremendous differences between councils who started earlier where their data is today versus the councils that did not do it. And, and you think that's just the modelling gives them a focus for their data collection and, and clean up and 
they end up knowing what they don't know? Is that the correct? Correct, Ross. It's it's absolutely that. The sense of purpose is everything, and by giving the data uh, purpose and um, analyze it to a very high degree, exposes some of the weak areas. Uh, but it also brings forward that um, aspect of turning data into useful information. Yeah, Ross, we can, we can actually summarise that um, from our observation is that those who decided not to model, say, 10 years ago because they didn't have good data, uh, generally still don't have good data. But those who uh, decided to model in spite of their um, lack of uh, robust data have now got some of the best data um, sets in the country and that whole modelling and interaction with data has encouraged a far better ownership and a far better application of using the information available. So just to summarise for our viewers, uh, what's come out in the last couple of years has been that the changing use of data, improving your data sets and the models really focusing you on that, but also Taking this st the strategic analytical view that uh, the DTIMS and IDS process has got is working at, with very small networks in New Zealand, much smaller than perhaps was originally imagined, and we're getting some really good gains out of that. So it doesn't matter what size your network is, it's worth considering. Thanks for watching this video. We'd encourage you to watch the next one in the series as well.